Welcome to Power Play for June 18th. A happy 57th birthday to International Trade Minister Ed Fast, who apparently didn't get a European Union free trade deal today as a gift, but the G8 did agree on Syria. We have expert analysis in a moment. And it is one day after a record was set for the latest ever date for an NHL playoff game to be played. I'm sure hockey writer Stephen Harper will mention this in his upcoming book. All right, don't adjust your set. It's that time of the year when we invite an MP from each party to co-host a show. They will not be paid for their what? appearances. You're not paid. What? I'm sorry, James. It's not going to happen. James Rajat, <laughs> Conservative MP James Rajat is in the chair today, itching to interview our journalists for a change. Coming up on today's show, a founding father of my party, the Conservative Party of Canada, will be here to push for one of his founding principles. Former Reform Party leader Preston Manning has some very stern advice for a Senate which is in desperate need of reform. We're in the final hours before the House of Commons rises for the summer and mud is being flung madly from all sides. Is there a better way? We'll consult with a very respected MP who advocates a more civilized approach. Yes, and a small newspaper in Ontario finally busted the mighty Prime Minister's office for trying to anonymously spread smear material against the Liberal leader Justin Trudeau. We ask the MPs if this is fair game, and then we ask our journalists why they play along. But first, the G8 summit's over, and the major issue that the Prime Minister hoped to tackle during the G8 meeting in Northern Ireland was the pending free trade deal with the European Union. Today, Stephen Harper called the talks interesting, but offered no details. British Prime Minister David Cameron did seem a little more upbeat. Uh, one more go, and it will be there. It wasn't possible to do it right here, that's uh, a pity, but the pressure of this G8, I think, really got through a lot of the final issues and it's now down to the, the last few yards and I'm sure it will be, be done. I don't think it will be sideswiped, as you put it, by the EU-US trade deal, which is just starting, but I would uh, think that it's in everyone's interest to get this one done and dusted uh, before other things start uh, kicking off. Okay, John Weeks is a former top Canadian trade negotiator, now an advisor with Bennett Jones. He joins me here in our studio. Mr. Weeks, I appreciate you coming in. I'm curious, though, it sounds to me like Canada is being fingered as the culprit, if you will, by the EU, EU yet we keep getting told that Canada is itching to find a deal, and the negotiators are over there and told, don't come home till you get a deal. Where's the truth here? Well, there seems to be a bit of backward and forward on both sides, and I guess I don't find that terribly encouraging because when you get to the end game you want to be reaching the point where you're going to be able to stand up and say we've reached a very good deal and uh, it's not encouraging to see people criticizing each other at this late stage hopefully that's just sort of posturing before they get into the final details and what we just heard the British Prime Minister say is uh, is how it's going to unfold it, it does sound to me as though they're starting to already switch the channels to go to the United States deal with the EU, or at least there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for that. Cameron was <coughs> talking about it, Obama was talking about it. Is the danger then that they start moving in that direction, which will be a massive deal, and we kind of get lost in the, uh, in the fallout? Well, I think that is a real risk, and uh, there's a lot of interest and excitement, really, I'd have to say, about the U.S., uh, EU deal. If you just doing a quick look through some of the media, there's a lot of interest, and I think uh, you know they're going to move that forward fairly quickly. The formal negotiations start in July. They'll have two more sessions this year. They're aiming at a two-year time frame, and um, it's 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 a big deal. A lot of excitement about what can be achieved there. So. Yeah. James? John, there's, there's always a lot of discussion, uh, speculation in terms of what are the final uh, items that need to be ironed out in, any ter in terms of any final deal. What, in your view, are the final items that new <laughs> do need to be ironed out in, in order for there to be a deal? Well, I think, you know, there's been an awful lot of discussion. And you're right, there are final items. And I think, you know, there's been coverage in the media in the last few days about what some of those might be. It's a little hard to know for sure when you're not actually sitting at the table. Um, I, I think we're at the point, though, where uh, both sides probably know uh, what it is they're likely to be able to get and what it is they might have to give to get that. And I think it's more at the stage now of trying to figure out whether it's worth the candle. Is this a deal that's got enough in it to be worthwhile? No deal is ever going to be perfect. And I'm not sure that by staying 
for a number of further months at the negotiating table that the package can really be improved that much. Well, that's it. If you're down to such minor details, you got the prime minister over there, the stage has been put out, yeah. and you can't walk up and say the deal's done. There must be something still big blocking the way, isn't there? Like, we hear cheese and beef, cheese and beef, you know? Like, uh, well, is beef that is it? definitely a big, huge, right? a big issue in Western Canada, That's and, and pork. So those are two big files. That's where, beef in terms of access for our beef and our pork. Yes, exactly. Being the Alberta MP that you are, yeah, I want to make yeah. sure that. And point. you know, it's supposed to be a, a free trade agreement, and you know, we've already had to agree in those two areas that we're talking about tariff rate quotas, so we won't be able to compete in an unlimited way in the EU market. Almost every other product in the negotiation apparently will come out with real free trade in terms of unlimited tariff access, but that won't be the case for beef and pork. So it is important to determine how much uh, access is going to be granted, and, and, and clearly that's going to be very important. Is the European Union being very careful about this because what Canada signs will be the template for what they sign with the U.S.? Well, I think uh, I, I read the other day that there was some thinking in the directorates in Brussels that they may be, we're uncomfortable with some of the things in the Canadian deal and having second thoughts about it. And I could well imagine, as they're thinking about what they're going to have to give the United States, they'd have a, a hard look. What exactly is in this Canadian deal again? And are we prepared to give this to the United States? Or, on something like beef, we're going to give the Canadians this much? So how much does that mean we're going to have to give the Americans? And, so and those... And how do you see the different views within the European Union? The Prime Minister made stops, obviously, in Ireland and France. I think to address some of the specific issues on our side we have provinces but there they have different countries with their very different views on certain items how do you think sort of the different countries views will play out in these negotiations well i think he touched base with some of the key people yeah. in terms of trying to open up the uh, the beef file certainly the irish and the french is where it's reported the resistance is and um you know that's it, it is a pretty difficult job for the european negotiators managing 27 member states and even though some are bigger than others it's 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 a pretty pretty tricky process and so will the implementation won't be straightforward yeah. either yeah, i don't think that's a good point and uh we we only have 10 provinces and i think the government's done a pretty good job of of working closely with the provinces and frankly what the provinces are putting on the table in this negotiation is going to uh, help improve the prospects of a good deal for Canada. Okay, that's enough. Thank you very much, John. We appreciate Thank you, you coming John. in. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so the other story out of the G8 mm -hmm. meeting is the final agreement on Syria was more unified than anyone expected. Here's the Prime Minister's take on the outcome. We have a very different outcome here and a much better outcome than I thought we were going to have. Uh, we don't have, as I said, G7 plus one. We have a genuine G8 statement. I ask you to read it carefully. It is very clear that what the Russians have moved towards, what all of us have said, is that we now want to see a transition in Syria. And I think it's spelled out very clearly, a transition to a government that is broadly representative. I don't think that can be interpreted in any way, shape or form as support for the current regime as it is. Well, the CTV's Daniel Hamamjan is at the G8 Summit. She brings us up to date as Stephen Harper's week-long getaway winds up. Danielle? Well, Don, they don't exactly all leave here one big happy family, but they were able to find some common ground. In the final statement, everybody agrees that there must be a transitional government in Syria. And if you ask Stephen Harper, there is no room for interpretation. That means that there is no room for Bashar al-Assad. Now, Vladimir Putin, he was asked today uh, whether at any point during the talks he felt isolated. He said no, even though somebody tried to make him feel that way, that somebody, likely Stephen Harper, remember two days ago he said that Putin was supporting, quote, a bunch of thugs in Syria. Harper today said that the outcome of this statement of the summit far different than what he had predicted. Now, more on Putin, he said today that... Um, he still doesn't believe chemical weapons were used by the regime, but he surprised a lot of people when he agreed to let UN inspectors in Syria to take a look. Now, next step in this whole thing is to revive the peace talks uh, at a conference in Geneva. For now, the summit is over in Northern Ireland. Next year, Don, in Russia. Wow. Beautiful scenery, Danielle. Thank you very much. James? Well, Don, as you know, I'm usually part of the MP panel, but... We have our Tuesday MPs after the break to discuss the mudslinging spring in a House of Commons right after we talk to an iconic Canadian 
for his advice on how to fix the Senate. Welcome back. Well, he's been demanding Senate reform for a quarter century, specifically in the form of an elected, equal, and effective upper, upper chamber. Today, Reform Party founder and former leader Preston Manning has penned an open letter to the Senate. Man, it sounded angry. He was describing a lot of ways for it to shape up before voters ship it out. He joins us from Calgary. Mr. Manning, i got to tell you, uh, you sounded extremely frustrated in that letter. Uh, do you see a way out of this short of abolishing the place? Well, I do, Don. What I was challenging the reform-oriented senators to uh, distance themselves from the delinquent senators and to get on with uh, proactively promoting the democratization of the place. Uh, and frankly, I, I think if that's not done, if Canadians don't see a strong group within the Senate actively promoting its reform, there's going to be this demand for abolition and very few people to stand in its way. That's one thing you did point out that also some of the current members, uh, you didn't use the term fat cats, but you sort of suggested they're protecting their existence at the expense of getting any action going on reform. Uh, do you see any way to break that log jam? Well, I, I think the what's tragic about this, Don, is that there's there are a, a number of conscientious senators who fill out all the forms and dutifully give their sober second thought to bills from the House and try to represent their regional interests, but they're being discredited by the actions of a few. And I, I think the Senate's got to disassociate itself from those folks, either expel them or uh, uh, cause them to uh, resign. I if they're proven innocent later on, then reinstate them. But uh, I, I think the, the honorable senators got to distance themselves from the others. A and then get proactive. Uh, you know, Al in Alberta, there's been over 3.3 million ballots cast in favor of uh, Senate, uh, Senate elections. A and there's been no recognition of that demand for democratizing the place. It's also reflected in, in other provinces. Where's the proactive reform-oriented coalition in that uh, Senate itself? It's time for them to step forward and if they don't, uh, someday some prime minister, maybe the current one, is going to stand up in the House of Commons and move the constitutional amendment to abolish and you would not have a lot of trouble getting that through most of the legislatures right now given the current climate. Well, Preston, uh, James Rajat here, and you did mention that the votes in Alberta with respect to the senators we have from our province who have received some mandate from the people of Alberta. The, but one of the challenges in terms of reforming the Senate is going through the amending formula where you can get seven provinces representing 50% of the population. But isn't that the biggest obstacle is the fact that you have provinces who either don't have an interest or in fact now are in favor of abolition? Isn't this the biggest challenge we have in terms of reforming the Senate? Well, I, I think it is. The argument I would make even with those provinces is you can't judge the effectiveness of the Senate in either representing regional interests or giving sober second thought to federal bills until the place is democratically accountable. So make it democratically accountable and then make a judgment as to whether the institution really adds something or not. And, uh, you know, you can rightfully ask the, uh, the, the various provincial governments and the people in the provincial legislature, are you not Democrats yourselves? If you are Democrats, then at least be in favor of democratizing the place so it can be judged as a democratic institution. I'm curious, Mr. Manning, if you think that uh, an MP that you brought into the fold, Stephen Harper, is a rookie back in the, uh, in the early 90s, do you think he doesn't shoulder some blame in this in the sense that he's picked people for purposes other than being the, the esteemed Canadians of sober second thought, and they've turned out to be bad apples in a big barrel? Well, I, I think he's f frustrated with it. I, I think most of these senators that he's appointed, he's expected them to do two things. One is to be fiscally responsible and help uh, balance the, the federal budget, but secondly, to be proactive in favor of uh, Senate reform. And uh, the fact that that's not occurred, I, I'm sure, is a source of uh, frustration to him. And uh, that, that's why I say, you know, the, the, we're getting close to the place where people who advocated Senate f reform for years, including myself, are saying, 
you know, Senate reform if possible, but if not possible, abolition. So the onus is on the Senate to prove that reform, genuine reform of the institutions possible. Uh, and I, I would imagine the Prime Minister uh, feels sentiments like that too. Preston, uh, the model that's been followed thus, thus far is to allow the provinces to hold the elections. What do you think about the possibility of the federal government then initiating their own elections so there would actually be federal Senate elections instead of the provinces conducting them? Well, I, I think that's, uh, that's a possibility, and it, it's better than not having any Senate elections at all. I, ideally, I'd like to see the, uh, the Senate elections promoted by provincial legislation, somewhat like uh, uh, Alberta has done. But, but the option you mentioned is, is a second choice, and it's better than leaving the place uh, undemocratic and, and unaccountable to the, the voters that are putting up, incidentally, uh, about $106 million, I think, this year. That's about a million dollars a senator. The taxpayers ought to have some control over the institution. Okay, President Manning, a must-read piece uh, today you produced. Um, I think it summed up a lot of our frustrations with the Senate right now. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks very much, Preston. Okay, thanks, Doc. Never thought you'd be interviewing your former boss oh, there, no. did you? It's fun, actually. <laughs> I thought you asked a pretty good question. All right, let's bring in our Choose the MVP, MP panel uh, for their views. Uh, normally, we'd have Megan Leslie, but she got called away for some glitzy thing. So we have Nathan Cullen, Sorry. another poor substitute. Yeah, Sorry, you guys. For the NDP. Uh, and did. Roger Kuzner is a standby. And James, you're usually on this usually panel. On so uh, I'm going to let you have first look at these guys. <laughs> Ask them any question you want. Well, last week, Megan asked Roger and I to go get haircuts, and I got mine. I don't know what Roger didn't quite well, follow. Well, Nathan doesn't need one. I got one. Yeah. 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 You're not going to comment on this? <laughs> See, this isn't so easy. You know. Liberals, There's we don't. There's a lot of cooperation going on here, Roger. We don't sole source, okay? So I've called for tender. We're going to have a, <laughs> at least you three tenders. You know to put this together? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's get to the scandals, not the niceties. I, I, I guess I'm watching what's happening in the House right now, and I, I find it worse than I've ever seen it. Um, a lot of people are commiserating at that sort of thing. Is anyone looking good right now? Nathan? Well, I, I, I think we look pretty good, only in the sense that uh, it, our, our greatest challenge as we set up question period in the, the beginning of the day and think about what's going on is that there are too many scandals that are erupting at any given time to fit them all into the 45 minutes of question period. That consistently conservative candidates and staffers are being investigated or arrested by the RCMP. The, the continued election fraud, we just had a ruling from the speaker that I, I know you know about, Don, just in terms of two conservatives that were, are in a fight, well one now, not so much, but that our, our electoral system is under siege. So it, the challenge for us has been uh, keeping enough attention of the public on all the various scandals from the Senate on down and to just government uh, it, incomprehensible mismanagement. So uh, the government's looking as bad as I've ever seen it. Uh, I know the speaker was yelling in the day today. today. Speaker what was, was that about? Well, there was the government had moved the 50th uh, closure of debate, the 50th timeout. 50. 50. That's a nice round number. It's, yeah. a, it's a nice 50 ain't easy, though, as, as some will attest. Uh, and it, it's 50 times that these guys have shut down debate in the House of Commons. Uh, it's the most undemocratic government in Canadian history, and they've broken every record that this this, par this parliament's ever seen. Roger, what's your take on what's going on in the circus? I mean, this house. Well, I, I know he's co-hosting with you today, but did he write this intro, you know, about the scandals? Okay, because there's, there's only one scandal. You, I know you like to say that, you know, Thomas Mulcair jumping the stop signs and, you know, being in the... It wasn't really high-speed pursuit or anything like that. <laughs> that, that. That's not a scandal, okay? It's maybe bad judgment on on Mr. Mulcair's part, maybe speaks to some part of that, but it, it's not a scandal. Uh, you know, the, the Eve Adams' ticket Steve Adams. today no, for no, using no. her cell phone? Not bad judgment, bad you know, judgment. bad driving maybe, but, uh, but you know, the, the, the scandal is the fact that in the Prime Minister's office, there was a $90,000 check written by a, a chief of staff uh, to uh, a member of parliament that was in the midst of uh, a, a, an investigation. And that's really the only scandal. There, there are a bunch of other issues that have caused a great deal of concern. It's been cranky on the Hill sure. for a whole bunch of reasons. The extended hours, the, you know, the, 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 there's a lot of rancor in the House. I mean, the, the whole Hill is torn apart. Trying to get around from one meeting to the next, meetings off, off the Hill and all that. Everybody's cranky with each other. We should have probably stuck a fork in it uh, last week. but. Uh, uh, I don't know if I should be sitting over there or <laughs> sitting here. You can, you can go, go stay on the, the dark bar. side. Stay on yeah. the dark side. <laughs> stay on the dark side. But I think, you know, 
I mean, let's be clear here. I mean, Ija Wright took responsibility for, for what he did. and, and a question here somewhere? Yeah, you okay, can, all right. can do let it, James. Come on, you so, can do so it. So let me then, in fairness, uh, yeah. frankly, last week I, I actually talked to Nathan about a bill, and he was very good. His party was very good. The Liberals were very good. Our party was very good at passing S-17, which deals with uh, tax conventions. So actually there's a lot of work being done sure. sort of underneath all of the sure. noise and rancor. Um, so I just put the question then to you two in terms of what would you do or what would you suggest to make it work better? I mean, my, one of my recommendations is actually have debates more like they have them in the UK Parliament sure. where they're actually time limited. And so you know, okay, you're going to have six hours well, of debate on this issue. The bill passes. Yeah. The government has some certainty in terms of when the bill passes. Sure. So just a couple of ideas from each yeah, of you in terms it, of how you would improve Parliament. The, the, way, the way Parliament functions right now has gone off the rails, you could say, right? It's just... 50 time allocations, it's never been seen, it's, it's, it's quite an abuse of power. And when Conservatives were in opposition, they hated it as much as we do. Because it, it just, it hits hard. You start a debate, you're an hour into it, and the government comes in and says, end of it. So if you're talking about providing some sort of consistency or certainty out of legislation gets through the process, I think that would be something we'd be open to. I think what happens in question period, because that's the most cantankerous moment in the day, is you ask a question, did you see a check, and you get some... <laughs> nonsensical answer about something completely different and so you get over time that builds up frustration every government's done it but I think we start uh, start looking at question period itself reforming the way that we ask the government question the way the government then responds back to us to give Canadians what they're actually expecting which now, is some sort of conversation rather than just a bunch of spin do you still support Michael Chong's reforms on question period we, we actually we part? actually t talked about moving things even further than that but we've we've struggled even at the committee that deals with this to get that conversation with the government and House affairs. that's right the procedure in House affairs is, is not been, we've been dealing with other things to be fair but getting that conversation with the government they kind of like things the way they are right now and it's been let's say a, a pretty strong headwind to say let's change Roger. things for the better well, uh, I know that my father-in-law, Cliff Hopkins, could never run the fish plant, uh, you know, on the, on the same rules that they run the House of Commons. It's, it's the inf inefficiencies in it are just incredible. And the amount of time that we've wasted over the last number of weeks, um, you know, it, it's a shame, really. Uh, I know there are conventions. I know that, the, you know, we have the standing orders and, and even the traditions around, uh, you know, the, the procedures and, and, and the House Affairs. But, uh, you know, I, I think we can all agree on the fact that there's a tremendous amount of time that, uh, that could be much, much better spent. I want to quickly bring in a, a bit of a sensitive one. The, the Prime Minister's uh, office was sort of outed today, if you will, by a little newspaper that said, I'm not taking your liberal smear leaks without uh, crediting the source of all this material, Justin Trudeau speaking engagements in the past. And I guess I'm curious about uh, whether you think that's something that's new or is that something that's always been thus and whether it's they're playing playing it fair roger you first since it's your leader that's been <laughs> smeared I, I thought it was pretty funny though you, you know the way that it, it was sort of like a, the bank robber that used a cab as a getaway car or the kidnapper that put the return address on the ransom note you know <laughs> they, they they made the call to sort of spill the beans on some of the speaking engagements and they used the, you know they phoned from the prime minister's office uh, so uh, they, they weren't that clean you know, I, the, the fact is, uh, the, the speaking engagements, um, th these were cleared by the Ethics Commissioner, and I'm sure that they're going to be exploited in the opposition or, or the government, and, uh, and the NDP will certainly go to town on that yeah. kind of stuff. But, you know, I well, think more egregious time. than that, let's look at the, the, the where uh, the Conservatives took over. There's $40 million annually going to uh, literacy organizations in this country. They've cut that in half. It's 20 million. Oh, now you're okay. changing the okay. channel. Oh, okay. Did Nathan, you see this? What? So here's the, the question you put was... controlling you guys. Yeah, yeah you're seeing how difficult we are? Uh, the, your question was about the Prime Minister's office phoning newspapers to right. try to plant stories. Yes. You think the Prime Minister's office would have something better to do? Yeah. You really do. I mean, come on. Uh, has this been done in the past? Probably. Is it getting more uh, amateurish? Probably. Uh, it's the end of a session. But I think the question of MPs and speaking fees is a valid question. I, th I think my friend would agree that if, if you're missing votes in the House in order to go earn income on the side, uh, whether it's from charities or churches or whatever, I, I think that's part of the conversation. But it's, it seems to me like that's a valid conversation as to whether MPs should be able to get paid. I will let you jump well, in I now. Can, oh. Yeah, if you want to play MP just for a while. Well, and I, I was going to ask a question. I'd say, I mean, I've known Roger a long time, but Roger, would you 
accept money from a charity to go speak to them? Because I think the answer would be absolutely not. I know I you, and I know you would true. not do that. I would, listen, you I'm not of the celebrity of, of Justin <laughs> Trudeau. I would not be offered I would not be but offered money. But if you were, would you? But you're you talking about a hypothetical oh, situation. No, 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 Audrey, are, are they, no, no, are they going to ask Peter Van Loan to it, go it, inspire it works, a group of young people? Let's be clear how this works. It works in the reverse. You put yourself up with one of these companies. It's That's not right. that a charity phones up. So no, Justin Trudeau chose to go they, with a company that was going to earn him speaking fees. Right. But the question that, is more right. Should MPs be jumping in with these companies to put themselves out for hire? I believe when I'm elected and go and sit in the House of Commons and get paid as a member of Parliament, part of my job is going out and speaking to the public. Yeah. So I don't put myself and in a speaker's bureau. And your job is to vote and your job is to show up And show in up and, be in, and, and not be not out making money on the side. That. And go on speaking tours. Listen, and take money from these charities. people I mean, come out and seek out Justin Trudeau, and he's raised millions of dollars for many oh, of these organizations. But no okay, but put a gun to his but head and said, "Join a speakers bureau." Like Roger, nobody's put a gun. Roger, nobody's put I a gun to his head. Nobody, nobody put a gun to the head of the organization and and, and requested Justin not. to come out. Okay, I, they I'm, wanted to come out. Uh, and the, the, the this Judith Baxter, this Ju Cape Judith Brand Baxter asked you to come speak to raise. You would do that for free. I know you would. Do you think I'd be offered twenty thousand dollars for that? I do that all the time. And Justin does you that all the time. But don't forget now, you know, the Prime Minister only has so many impersonations he can... They have to change the channel in some way. So this, <laughs> this is a changing is of the channel. He's out of impressions. He's a pro. And by the way, he always gets the last word. <laughs> <laughs> really? Always, I was going to try to yeah. maybe no, say no, something no, at no, the no, end. No. He got him in a question he wouldn't answer. All right. I'm going to wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you all. Roger will be here on Thursday as co-host. Right? Sweeps week this wow. week. You were here sweeps last week. Are you guys looking for ratings? The ratings. All right. have a haircut. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Coming up, the headlines are screaming about police investigations of the Senate, the Ontario government, and city councils in Canada's two largest cities. Coming up, we ask a former clerk of the Privy Council if this is an unprecedented burst of corruption or politics as normal with the culprits just getting caught. Please stay with us. Being Mayor of Montreal, is not a task that one can do while defending themselves against accusations of this nature. And I hope you will understand that I'm going to put my energies into my defense and into my family. This is why I am resigning as Mayor of Montreal. It is the responsible thing to do. Well, another one bites the dust in Montreal, and there appear to be police investigations in every political corner these days. Not only Montreal, there's Toronto, London, Ontario, Queen's Park, and even the Senate getting a closer look from the RCMP or other forces. Mel Cap doesn't want to be known as a corruption specialist, but he is the former clerk of the Privy Council. He's now with the School of Public Policy and Governance, and he joins me from Toronto. Mr. Cap, I, I, I guess I'm trying to get a handle on what we're seeing here, this convergence of corruption charges, and I'm, I'm wondering if we're actually seeing uh, a new political behavior mode or if we're just seeing people getting caught, uh, and I don't know why all this oversight doesn't seem to be working. Well, it's a good question, but frankly, I think um, in some respects it was ever thus. Um, I, I used to work, and the Prime Minister's office is in the Langevin block in Ottawa. It's named after Hector Langevin. Good old Hector was the Minister of Public Works in the 1890s, and he had to resign because of a corruption scandal. There were buckets of money going in the front door, and they went out the back door, not for construction, but for his personal use. <laughs> Uh, so, in some respects, it was ever thus. But I think you've got to really put this in perspective. Um, there's a difference between people who abuse privilege and people who enrich themselves. And it's the enriching of yourself that I think is corruption. And, and we should preserve the word for that use. And what's going on in the Charbonneau Commission and in Montreal is, frankly, uh, as close... Well, the allegations are of corruption, indeed. But look at Transparency International. They assess 176 countries around the world, and they put Canada among the top eight in non-corruption. That's above the United States and above the United Kingdom. I think we're doing okay. Well, they might downgrade that after they've seen what goes on in Rob Ford Nation and Montreal. <laughs> One never knows. Um, I wouldn't mind your thoughts, though, on this Nigel Wright, Mike Duffy situation, because you, as you point out, were in the in you know in the Privy Council office. Is that 
giving you a lot of queasy feeling from what you're seeing, albeit allegations, and we don't really know the, the whole story. Does that bother you as a, a real sign of big things that are happening that are going wrong? Well, Don, you know, uh, since I don't know the facts, um, I may as well comment, uh, like the rest of you in the media. Um, I, I think that uh, there are interesting questions to be explored. I really don't know what went on. It, it strikes me that if this is a scandal, it's a scandal about someone who wrote a check for $90,000 to pay the taxpayer. It's sort of an odd thing that that's a considered corruption. What it is, is perhaps, and this is a, per, a big perhaps, and the RCM police will look into it, uh, that it may be a violation of the Parliament of Canada Act, or it may be a violation of the criminal code in terms of uh, buying influence. But how could the chief of staff to the prime minister used the money to buy influence. Look, I don't have the facts. I don't know what was actually done. It's a curiosity, though. It is a really strange one, I've got to say. James? Well, Mel, I, I appreciate your perspective on this. And, and in terms of uh, governance, what I'd like to, to know from you is we've moved in the last number of years towards sort of more rules, more regulations, more oversight, more transparency. I mean, in your view, should we keep moving down this road, or is there a better way to, to govern these things such that we do deal with, uh, you, you mentioned uh, sort of the relative perspective in terms of where we are as a nation, in terms of dealing with actual problem situations. So is there a better system or model of governance you should put in place to deal with these types of matters? Well, look, James, I think you're asking the right question. Um, I personally think the more you legislate and put in place rules and laws to deal with this, the less you ask people to use their judgment. I think that's what the real problem is in this. What you want are people to use their judgment. And what we've got, and with all due respect to you and the, the Harper government, it was your very first bill, C-2 in uh, 2006, which was the Federal Accountability Act. And you can have too much accountability. Accountability on the face of it is a good thing. But if you put rules in place that take away from people the obligation to use their judgment, then they're going to follow the rules and they're going to push the limits of the rules. I think that's a bad thing. I think we want people to get some general direction and then use their judgment. And, you know, the, you know if you sit back and say, is this a legitimate claim or not, um, and you're asking it against the rules, you'll put in a lot more claims for travel than if you ask yourself, is this something I should really charge the taxpayer for? And if you use the second test, I think we'll end up with saving some money. But if you're worried about every time there's a mistake, you try to, to legislate away the mistake, you're going to have a, a super burden of rules that take away from people the obligation to use judgment. Good point. All right, Mel Cap, uh, we really appreciate your perspective on this. Makes a lot of common sense. Maybe they should follow it more there. James? That's an odd idea. Thanks very it? much, Mel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, anyone watching the House of Commons on television these days might think there has to be a better way of doing parliamentary business. After the break, we talk to my distinguished colleague, Michael Chong, the represent and the representative of the think tank studying parliamentary reform. Your cat gets bored and wants to play, but that can spell trouble when you're away. Introducing Cat's Meow, the exciting new cat toy that keeps your kitty entertained at play both night and day. Just press the button and watch Cat's Meow silently attract your pet instantly as she tries to catch the peekaboo wand. No matter what their age, cats love to stalk and pounce on prey. It's a natural instinct that won't go away. Just like a scurrying mouse, Cat's Meow swings back and forth, peeking in and out of the carousel cover. With random movements, it speeds up and slows down. Then it surprises the kitty by changing directions when you least expect it. So your cat will never get bored. Now you see it, now you don't. Come one or come all. It's so crazy, your cats will go crazy for Cat's Meow. Older cats can get fat and lazy and that's not healthy. With Cat's Meow, your cat is so active, you'll turn lazy kitty into crazy kitty. No matter how old or slow, your cat will be as playful as a kitten. Made of durable nylon, Cat's Meow will last for years. Even when your cat catches the mouse, 
Cat's Meow just keeps on running. Battery-operated Cat's Meow operates anywhere your cat likes to play. You'll enjoy hours of fun watching your cat and mouse. Cat's Meow gives Kitty a place to play and stops them from tearing away. Now order your very own Cat's Meow for the special TV price of just $19.99. Let your kitty enjoy hours of Cat's Meow fun. But wait, call right now and you'll get a second Cat's Meow free. Just pay separate shipping and handling. Cat's Meow is the perfect gift for every cat lover. You get it all. Two Cat's Meows for just $19.99. So call or click now. To order your Cat's Meow, please call 1-800-377-8049 or order online at getcatsmeow.ca. Play co-hosts are invited to suggest a discussion topic on the show that they appear on, and I pick parliamentary reform. To discuss how our system could be improved, we are joined from Toronto by Jane Hilderman from the Samaricana Think Tank. Hello, Jane. I just want to quickly uh, illustrate something to show the low level of conduct right now in the House of Commons with summer approaching. Uh, consider this tweet from a rather furious Liberal MP, Scott Bryson, which was fired off this afternoon in question period. He says it's putrefied to such an extent I feel like taking a shower every day at 3 p.m. sharp. That's when question period ends. James Moore et al. are self-splattering. Very nasty stuff. All right, James, over to you. <laughs> well, not very positive. On that very positive note, Don. <laughs> Jane, I wanted to uh, get your perspective, obviously, with re respect to Samara. You interview a lot of uh, present members of Parliament, former members of Parliament, in terms of how to improve Parliament and how to engage uh, citizens much more. So I'd, I'd like to perhaps ask you a few questions in terms of some of the findings that you, you discover from interviewing president and former members of parliament. Mm -hmm. and what are the, some of the things that they see in terms of how you would improve the House of Commons and the Senate? Uh, yes, so we uh, at Samara conduct a series of exit interviews with former members of parliament. Uh, we've done 79 to date, and uh, from those 79, there's a really wide array of different recommendations that MPs have for things that they would uh, maybe it would have done differently or would like to see changed about how the House uh, works. Uh, I think they can kind of be categorized into two different uh, broad things. The first is uh, when MPs hit the ground running and during orientation, they often report feeling quite overwhelmed with the uh, volume of information and rules that they have to learn to be effective members of Parliament. So there's a point there that perhaps we can help improve uh, their ability to learn to be effective MPs qu more quickly. Uh, the second point comes ab back to that uh, question about connecting uh, Canadians better to the politics and the work of MPs uh, that's going on at, on the Hill on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there's a lot of different ideas about reform uh, that we can chat about, some coming from other jurisdictions that uh, could be adapted. Others are you know, more about uh, opening up Parliament using different technologies. One thing, Jane, that struck me today, uh, conservative, uh, former Conservative MP Brent Rathgeber got up and asked a question. Uh, he said it had been nagging at him about uh, uh, House behavior. Is, is what he was talking about, or is what he, his resignation uh, signified, do you see some hope in there that maybe Parliament will reform itself almost one MP at a time? Do you see that's a possibility? Well, I would probably go back to the Speaker's ruling on Mr. Warawa's uh, matter of privilege. And it was a powerful one in the sense it really emphasized that MPs still do have a voice in the House of Commons, but they have to seize it um, if, they, if, they, if they so choose, if they want to be more influential in that, in that capacity. And I think it was an important message for all um, members of Parliament about their essential, a reminder of their essential role, which is that they're there um, to represent their constituents, they're there to represent Canadians, and um, that they do have a forum that will allow them to exert, um, you know, their voice on behalf if they want to. And Rath Gaber's choice to leave the caucus is perhaps a more extreme example of uh, that sort of weighing of how he can best do that work on behalf of his constituents, I think. And he came down deciding that uh, he wanted to have as independent a voice as possible. But Jane, 
Jane, do you see some, some, some systemic things that we should do? We had in the last Parliament Michael Chong's motion on question period. I think if we look at the British system in terms of how they do their debates, um, there are other jurisdictions, and you mentioned sort of on a comparative sense, where we could actually look at what other parliaments do. I find the UK Parliament much better in terms of a debating body. Should we be doing some of the things they're doing in terms of a systemic change? It's an interesting point, and many former MPs have spoke quite candidly about um, how the floor of the House of Commons is not always the most interesting or substantive place for discussion, not just in QP, but even during legislative debates. Uh, one MP even described it as a waste of time, which just doesn't uh, do so well if this is going to be the heart of our uh, representative democracy. So yes, a, an important question is how do we raise um, the tenor of debate, the exchange of ideas. Uh, the British system has a, a different set structure for their question period uh, that allows um, sort of a, a different ministers to come and speak on designated days. Uh, they also have a different kind of culture around the use of notes during speeches and an expectation that members have to stay uh, for the duration of debate uh, if they want to participate in the debate, which are little okay. things that don't exist here in Canada. All right, Jane, we appreciate you taking the time. Michael Chong was held up uh, on the hill, so we couldn't get him, but we appreciate your input, James. Thanks very much, Jane. Appreciate it's, that. It's been a pleasure. Well, after the break, I get to turn the tables and ask journalists a few questions. Don will no doubt want to talk about Justin Trudeau's problems, but I will ask about more important matters like the government's new data portal, which was announced today. Welcome back to Power Play with James Rajat. But first to our press gallery to end the program. Joel, Joel Denis Bellevance is with La Presse. Stephanie Levitz with Canadian Press. I know he wants to talk about data portals, but we want to talk about Justin Trudeau's <laughs> speaking fees. Not just Justin Trudeau's speaking fees. You've got data. Spill it. Yep. Jacques Demers, a Tory senator, was appointed by the Prime Minister in 2009, I think. Um, he uh, does a lot of speaking uh, tours in Quebec and in English Canada. And last year, he made several speeches, and uh, earning him $52,000 last year. So okay. that's a lot of money. And we asked him what he thought about the controversy about Justin Trudeau, my colleague Hugo de Grand Prix did. And Mr. Demers said, I can't blame him. I can't throw a rock at him because he did that. I'm doing it and I think it's quite legitimate. Hmm. Sometimes I do it and I give some money to the cherry the to whom I'm speaking. I'm collecting money but I'm still making them a gift. Um, and I think uh, it's legitimate to do that. So the Tory strategy of attacking Mr. Trudeau is a bit falling apart today as a result of what we are discovering. Usually he's much nicer to us, actually. <laughs> I well, I think the Prime Minister is very clear, though, from the GA meeting in terms of if we are doing charity events, we should donate our time and we should be donating to the charity. So, I mean, we're very clear on that, and I think that will continue to be the position. Jane, is there a but I'm not supposed to be answering questions. <laughs> no, I don't know. Really asking I thought we were well, talking about the data portal. Well, we and I know in a moment. I want to get to Steph. To I mean, and Steph, on this Trudeau smear thing out of the PMO, the PMO goes to the Barry advocate and says, hey, here's the stuff, along with everybody else. Yep. Uh, why do journalists play along? Why don't they say, hey, I'm not going to play ball with the PMO and leak your smear material for you and credit an anonymous source? Why don't they say, hey, PMO is trying to peddle this stuff and we don't want to play ball with them anymore? Which is exactly you know, what Barry did today and I think there's a lot of journalists in the gallery sort of cheering them on and saying good on you for outing mm -hmm. them. You know, good Toronto on you Star for, jumped in right away and said, you know, hey, that, <clears throat> we got it too. Yeah, but you know, then ran it, right? After so, the effect. After the effect. After the effect. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I guess there's a lot of reasons. I mean, there's the competitive pressure. There's the nature of, you know, the, one of the things that, that happens with leaks in this town is that you're promised to leak before you know what it is, and you don't really have the right of first refusal after the fact. So you're taking a gamble, and you're saying, okay, what are they going to give me? Is it going to be any good? And you agree to the terms of, you know, these embargoes, such as they are, or, or protecting the source, or whatever it is, ahead of time. And whether that's the best journalistic practice, I, I mean, I would doubt it. Today, there was a, a ministerial spokesman who tried to convince me that he was going to give me material under embargo, even though his department had already leaked the story to the Globe and Mail. Ooh. So sometimes you wonder... It didn't go over very well with you then, did it? <laughs> well, it's just you wonder sometimes about the way they look at communications and if they understand how we do what we do. Okay, let me turn the tables a little bit. Okay. Here comes Come the data on. portal. We all know each other. Yeah. The, the reality is, in this town, there's an awful lot of communication that's, uh, that's on background, off the record. A lot of communication that goes on between members of the media, press gallery, and politicians, parliamentarians. So I don't know why we're sort of, I think we're blowing this out of proportion. With all due respect to my wonderful co-host here. But the reality is there's an awful lot of communication that goes back and forth between 
you know, birds of a feather, as, as Alan Fothering used to describe us. I think there's so, room for a broader discussion about the issue that just le leapfrogs out of this PMO thing. I mean, another great example, right, is when you have these officials, these government officials at the G8 are negotiating at other tables, and journalists aren't allowed to name them. Uh, we only get government background briefings on policy and things on background, which doesn't, why just not put your name to the, like, why can't this deputy minister or this somebody just say, yeah, I speak on the part of the government. The United States does that. Other governments do that. Jardine? It's an interesting point that uh, uh, Mr. Rajati is raising. It's true that it's part of our job to get information. Sometimes you get it under, uh, you know, confidence, confidentiality. And so we have to observe that. And without protecting my sources, sometimes I wouldn't get information. It's part of the job. But that kind of, uh, it's, it's a bit of a dirty tactics that was used by people in the Prime Minister's office, and some, most of those business should be done by party officials. If they want to remain anonymous, that's fine, but the Prime Minister's office usually serve all Canadians and not a partisan but, purpose. But, Joel Denis, you, come on, I mean, let's, <laughs> let's, you've been here a long time. PMOs in the past, have they ever done, of course they have. I mean, uh, Susan Delacourt wrote a blog on yeah. this today saying that this has happened in the past. Right? In, in, yeah, I mean, this, on as a, a, I mean, when I was here as an opposition yeah. MP, the budget was on the front page of the Globe and Mail before it was even presented in the House of Commons. That's true. Mm -hmm. that, that's so, a good point. I, I, you know, but, yeah. but it was not a, a budget is I think not necessarily a, a partisan uh, yeah. uh, attack against a leader of the yeah. party. It's quite there's a bit of a difference here. Yeah. But actually, you've done a very good segue into the the open government <laughs> a new website. We actually have a website and we're, in up. terms of transparency. And I yeah. was I was at it on it today. I think it's a very good site. So we Stephanie, a, I, I think we have a graphic. We do have a graphic. We should show that. Yeah, there it is. Look Join the Google Hangout. So that's that's very impressive. How's that going to work? You just click on whatever you want and off you go? Yeah, you, it's this thing called the Internet, Don. You go on and you... Uh, <laughs> okay, sort of, okay. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> I've been smacked you know, Al Gore <laughs> created it years ago. <laughs> what I thought was interesting about this announcement is that it was announced first by the Prime Minister through a uh, uh, press release uh, from London uh -huh. praising the openness of this government before Mr. Uh, Tony Clement, the President of the Treasury Board, announced it. So I guess the Prime Minister wants to put his footprint on but, this. But this builds on what uh, Minister Clement had announced yeah. previously. So. But can an I, international commitment on yeah. the part of the government. But do you think it works? Can I, do you like the website? Well, do you think, like the information? I, I think the biggest change that they've made in, in this regard is the licensing factor. And I don't mean to like sort of geek out on your viewers, but one of the biggest issues about the way the government was doing this before was that it was really confusing for private businesses or researchers or whatever to understand and what am I allowed to do with this data? Let's say I downloaded this great information, I built an app. Does the government own the app? So, you know, I think they've made some, they've freed it up more, and that's a good thing. We're out of time. Out Thank of time. you, Stephanie, Joel Denis, and that's it for Power Play. My thanks to the co host, James Rajat. Do you have fun? I had a lot of fun. In fact, I get can, it. I, can I read one of my I'm fan to... mails here? Yeah, quickly. Okay, from a good friend of mine I read there, he says, Nice job on TV. But your makeup makes you look like Art Carlson from WKRP when he ran for mayor. <laughs> and with thanks, that, Rob. we say thanks very much for watching. James Rajat will be back here next week. NDP leader Megan Leslie's here tomorrow. Thanks. We hope you can tune in. I'm Don Martin. Have a good night. Thanks for having me, Don.